Just go right to <laughs> All right, I'll call to order the meeting board of education meeting for tonight and we'll stand and do the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, and tonight we have all board members present except for Lisa Killian and Jamie Lewis. And we need an adoption of the agenda and the supplemental report. Make a motion. Okay, Tracy made a motion and Jeff second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And I looked over the bills and everything looked Good. Um, I'll make a motion for approval. So Tammy makes the motion and Ryan makes a second. All in favor? Aye. And tonight, this is kind of fun. I get to kind of fill in on a fun night. Yay. So we have some special presentations. So we have a check presentation from Jimmy John's Dodge City to the nutrition department. Actually, they only know me because I go there once or twice a week. <laughs> you probably know me by my order and not by my name. That's, that's for sure, right? Okay, so they just were so amazingly gracious, and they had an event um, over Halloween. It was um, Frites for, Bites for Bites, and I'm going to ask Jillian to just say a word. Evening. Um, so we just did this event kind of in lieu of Boo at the Zoo not happening. Um, and the funds that we generated from this event were donating to the nutrition department to cover outstanding meal account balances for the kids in the district. That is awesome. Yeah, thank you very much. And our next presentation is to Keisha Batman, a student. Keisha is a DCHS video production teacher. Her students won Rookie of the Year Award in the Kansas Turnpike Authorities Put the Brakes on Fatality State Competition. Come on forward, yeah. Yay! Yeah. First thing I want Keisha to do is tell us what her new last name is. It's T Meyer, but you say it, well, you say it like T Meyer, but you spell it like Ty Meyer, or you can just keep calling me Batman because that's a cooler last name. <laughs> <laughs> like a TV reporter. Exactly. So tell us a little bit about this. So this is not about me at all. Um, I'm just lucky enough that I get to teach these amazing students. So we have Brandon and Nayeli here, and this year they decided to take part in our KTA um, competition, which is thrown every year um, by the Kansas Turnpike um, Authority, and they do it out of Topeka, I believe. And so this year their video got third place in the entire state out of all high schools, and they did really amazing. We're missing one student, Daniel, but it's really uh, the applause goes to them. So they were amazing. Thank you. 
we have a clip of that video or are we not showing the video tonight? Or I, I think you sent the link and we looked at the link on that, so I think we did that. So, Well, let's come up here and be recognized here too and teach her as well. Yeah. Okay. Next, we have Christopher Spindler, DCHS Animation Game Design AR and VR. The flagship Kansas Tech Teacher of the Year Award is prestigious accolade that recognizes the most innovative, dedicated, and inspiring educators in the realm of technology across Kansas. This award is given to an outstanding teacher who has demonstrated exceptional skill and integrity to technology within the curriculum, engaging students in hands-on technology, learning and fostering a classroom environment that stimulates curiosity, innovation, and technological literacy. In addition to exhibiting personal dedication to their own professional development in technology, the awardee consistently pushes the boundaries of traditional teaching methods and endeavors to prepare their students for a technology-driven world. They are recognized for their tireless efforts in bridging the digital divide, encouraging diversity and inclusion in technology education, and for their steadfast commitment to the development of the next generation of tech leaders in Kansas. Well said. Very good. I know it's a step down from having the co founder of Apple. Yeah. So we're proud of that too. So that's why we wanted to give you that recognition. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. He is great. You know, I kind of. of our faction voting for our enemy in that sense. Okay. We all know who he is. Yeah. And my students went, who's that old guy? Is he your dad? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it would be bad if he was. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so, uh, though as far as for the for Dodge City and the district, I, I think the biggest thing here is this is students nominating. This is not this is not administration nominating. And last but not least, we have the check presentation from Sunflower Bank. You come here. Um, <laughs> I'm not in the spotlight. <laughs> Hello, I'm Jessica Slattery, Regional Manager for Sunflower Bank, and we have Maria Fierro, our Branch Manager for Dodge City Sunflower Bank. Uh, we've been doing the ABC program for since 2001, and you guys have been a partner with us for 22 years. Um, we're super excited about that. I'm super excited because I've been a part of the program for just as long, same with Maria. <laughs> and so we're very passionate about the community, about the schools, and I have to say Dodge City has always been one of our biggest recipients for our ABC program. 
um, bank wide across our entire footprint. So that I think says a lot about the community participation and the commitment that the people have for USD 443 um, and their passion for education. So today we'd like to present you a check for this year's contributions from our ABC program. Totaling, I gotta read it. <laughs> I don't have it memorized. $8,964.96. Yeah, wow, thank you very much. We also have a big announcement to make with Sunflower Bank. They've been named the official corporate partner of the Backyard Battle Rivalry Series. So that's kind of a big thing, and we're wanting to just share that information. Um, it's it's um, because of the partnership with the Dodd City and Liberal High School Athletic Departments that they announced this Backyard Battle rival Rivalry Series. Dodd City and Liberal have been competing on the football field since 1919. And um, that's a 6-0 Red Demon victory in, 20, in 1921. The rivalry moved to a basketball court, a DC win. Fast forward to 23-24 school year. The rivalry includes multiple matchups across 20 sports each year. Over the course of the past 100 years, the rivalry has evened out and grown not only in intensity, but also in the number of events hosted by the two communities showcasing their modern facilities. The rivalry series will begin this winter as Dodd City High School and Liberal High School will compete for a trophy that will be presented each time the two schools compete in the following. Boys and girls basketball, boys and girls wrestling, the series hopes to expand to several more potential events over the course of the spring and fall seasons. We just wanna say thank you. Um, like I said before with the ABC program, we're super passionate about education and our communities. And I think we feel that, the Dodd City uh, Demon Pride, and we wanna expand that to our liberal community. They're also very passionate. Um, we're partners, we work side by side. I work at both of the locations, and we're super excited to bring liberal into that mix and help get their community involved and support the schools just as much as Dodd City supports ours. So thank you for allowing us to participate. And we just can't wait to see that Dodd City brings home the bell. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> And I do have a quote from Jay Gifford. What better sponsor for these annual battles than, than Sunflower Bank of Dodd City and Liberal? Sunflower Bank, founded in 1892, has been around even longer than the rivalry between the two schools. And go Dodge City to keep that bell here. So we'll be ringing the bell for sure. <laughs> Well, that's always fun and enjoyable to be able to do things like that. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna be doing is a public hearing regarding board policy, JBCC, enrollment of non-resident students. Basically, regarding this is what we have to do is have a short public hearing if anybody wants to contest or provide input to JBCC, which is our enrollment of non-resident students that was presented at the last board meeting. So basically, it's kind of a formality that we have to do ahead of the approval later on in the agenda. So if anybody wants to speak on JBCC. You invite anybody that wants to come forward? Not at this time. Thanks. All right. Thank you. All right, now we get Stuco reports. Vivian Wynn from the Dodge City High School. Good evening, board members and Dr. Dirksen. My name is Vivian Nguyen, and I'm the president of the student council at our high school. Last month, our top, contribu top contributions at the school were the trunk or treat and the boot pops. On October 24th, we hosted our annual trunk or treat at the Memorial Stadium. 
Community and school clubs were all invited to join us in celebrating Halloween and passing out candy and passing out candy. We had a huge success as many trunks ran out of candy by 6.30 p.m. Our trunk or street, our trunk or treat started at six. Rupas was another huge contribution that we did that was new to the school this year. We created ghosts by wrapping tissue paper over bow pops and drawing on a ghost face to pass out to our students. Hundreds of boo pops were sold to help school spirit. For this next month, we are starting to plan our floor show, which will be December 5th at 7 p.m. This theme for the floor show is the Eras Tour or Taylor Swift. We are also beginning to, to plan our winter homecoming or formal to help raise school spirit in hopes to continue to build a positive school community for all. Do you guys have any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And next we have Christian Chavez from CMS, student council president. Good evening, board members. I'm Christian Chavez, uh, Comanche president. Uh, first things first, I'll give the results of our la last month's, uh, so our Halloween dance, the results of that. Um, we did make a substantial um, profit from that. I think we made $100 from that. So yeah, that'll help with uh, what we have coming up this month. We have Kindness Week, which is basically, uh, we're just gonna spend all week trying to help encourage students to be more kind, you know, said hi in, uh, in the hallway, you know, give handshakes and stuff all around school. And we're also gonna donate to our nurses here in Dodge. We want, we're trying to raise money to help make gift bags for them since so just to thank them for all they've done for us in our community, especially during COVID. So we just wanna say thank you for that. We also have our donation drive. We're right now collecting food this, this, this week. And at the, end of, at the end of the week on Friday, we will be donating to the Manor House, anything, uh, any food particles we have collect, uh, we've collected. And I think that's about it. Okay, thank you. And then finally, we have Emilia Klink from Dodge City Middle School. She's not here? Okay. Oh, okay. Well, go DMS. Okay. And then we have the elementary report from Ross Elementary. brought my sidekick. Um, thank you so much for uh, board and Dr. Dirksen to let us highlight a few of the things that are going on in the elementary world. Um, we kind of organized it by community um, connections and then some family family events. So it was kind of neat to, to see all the uh, community connections that our schools are doing. So um, Bright Beginnings, they partnered with uh, Victory Electric for their pumpkin event. And they brought their literacy bus out there, and so they were able to have books and uh, visit with the community about literacy. Um, Sewell brought in a visitor, the Wichita War Dancer, a Native American who performed for the students, so gave them some exposure and experience to that. They also are um, partnering with, let's see, Dodge City Women's Chamber, and they're doing a um, food, um, sorry, I just drew a blank, or food donations for Mana House. So I thought that was neat that they partnered with another organization in town. Um, let's see. At Ross, we live right across the street from uh, Reflections Living. And so we have um, connected with their activities director, and we have quite a few um, different events where our students are going to be partnering and making relationships with the uh, residents um, there. We're working on some pen pals, some Christmas cards and um, just going and sometimes performing uh, a play or something just for the uh, residents. Um, and we've already we've already got a lot of um, benefits from that. The kids are loving it, and so we're um, helping kind of bridge some of that relationship. Um, also, we have at Ross we had the mayor of Dodge City come to visit our first graders. Um, I just wanted to share our favorite question. They asked him. 
uh, what dollar bill he was on. I thought that was cute. <laughs> and when the president was coming. They have like high hopes for us bringing in these, uh, get these guests now. So um, we thought that was um, really neat that they got to have that opportunity. The fire department has been to the schools. They've shared the smokehouse and talked about fire safety. And then um, we also have been because of our location, it's great. Whenever we're sending any athletes off to state um, state um, events, we're out there cheering and yelling for our Dodge City Demons. And so our kids have got to participate and do that too. So that's been fun. And good evening, board. Um, so November has already been a month full of events for our families in elementary world. Um, we started to enjoy watching our students perform at the music, po uh, music programs. Miller and Central hosted a literacy cafe here um, at the Civic Center. Um, other schools had a Veterans Day assembly, and we started to also do first quarter awards assemblies um, to recognize student great uh, character and um, academic growth as well. Um, some upcoming events include turkey bingo and Thanksgiving lunch with families, and um, Sewell will be having their McTeacher night on November 28th, so stop by to support. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, next, we have recognition of visitors. Persons may present ideas or concerns regarding USD 443 schools. No action will be taken by the board at this meeting. Personalities and behaviors of employees are not to be presented during this period, but are to be reported to the employee's immediate supervisor. The president shall determine, or vice president, shall determine the amount of time to be spent for citizen participation. Anybody? Okay, I don't see anybody. Okay, so next we're gonna move on to consent agenda. So the first item is approval of personnel, including the supplemental personnel report. Then approval of minutes for October 23rd, 2023 Board of Education meeting. Approval of donation to the 443 Nutrition Department from Jimmy John's, Dodge City. Approval of donation of a steel bench to the DCHS from DCHS Class of 1973. Approval of donations to Northwest Elementary with several donors. Approval of donations to DCHS, another thing, several donors. Approval of uh, FY 2024 Perkins Secondary Reserve Cluster Review Grant Award to DCHS. Approval of appointment of board treasurer. Oop, I skipped one. Approval of 2023-2024 site council membership list for Northwest Elementary. And approval of a Leo software maintenance renewal. Are there any questions anybody has over any of those items? A motion by Jeff and a second by Jamie. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. New business. Curriculum and instruction. With yep. Matt. <laughs> okay. All right. Tonight we're coming forward to approve JBC and JBCC. Um, real quick on JBC, that was our original policy. The only update to it is removing the non-resident piece out of it because now we have JBCC, which will encompass the whole non-resident piece. So the update on that, that's as simple as that is. On JBCC, 2567 Senate bill required that we, starting next year, accept out-of-district enrollment kids if they choose to come to Dodd City. It's not up to, our, up to us on any sort, but we can set guidelines in place that if they're not meeting certain standards where there's attendance behavior, we can revoke that right. So it does give you an out a little bit, but uh, with this, as policy says by January 1st, we have to have these policies adopted. By May 1st, we have to present you with what we anticipate each building's enrollment capacity will be so we can post that on our website to say we got room or we don't have room at each level. I'll be coming to you in April. I haven't pinpointed the exact date to present that information to you. And the bad part about it is it's so early that you really never know what your enrollment's gonna look like. You never really know how many teachers you might be short. And that's kind of one of the big pieces in legislation right now that they're saying it kind of leaves a lot of school districts 
unsure of how we're moving forward. But that's the bill as it's written now. So for tonight, I need you to approve JBCC, non-resident students, and the update to JBC. Do you have any questions over either of those? No residency requirement. You know, and I, I really think this is going to be a lot bigger issue in the cities, you know, to have multiple schools and it's going to be with us. I mean, we've, honestly, we usually take kids that want to come here unless there's just such a history that we don't feel it's safe. And, and I, I want to point out, using a real example, that this summer we did have a student try to apply here from another district. And after doing a background check, it was in our best interest not to accept that student because at the time we didn't have to. And next year, fast forward, same situation, that is not our choice. So that's how this law has changed, how this rule will work. We were, we're one of the few that had a policy in place already on, on this. And uh, that's why we have the two confusing JBC and JBCC. Not every district had that, some did. And we were one of them that did, so. For the new one, we had pieces in place that we could say, no, we're not going to accept this student. Exactly. Or, you know, one of the things I'm still trying to clear up is it isn't specific on at what points of the year you can say you aren't meeting the expectations of the district or not. I need to try to find out if at any time they fail to meet the expectations if we have to wait for a year yeah. or not. So our, our current interpretation is that we have to take them for a whole year. Um, it doesn't mean they can't be suspended or whatever, but there are students for that year. But that. If there is a history of, of misbehaviors or whatever the situation might be that we can say it isn't working for you but i wanted you to be aware of that okay i can see this evolving over time yeah i no doubt yeah that, that was gonna be my question is it so if a kid from darden gets expelled for bringing a knife to school right and it comes to dawn well we still are allowed within the expulsion discussion. period. We don't have to yeah. take kids who are expelled from other districts. And once that expulsion has run its course, they would be allowed to enroll in our school. Teachers. So it does still keep that protection in. So tonight I'm asking the update of JBC and the approval of JBCC, resident and non-resident students. It's been a motion by Jared and a second by Ryan. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And if anything changes, I'll keep you updated through weekend review and current status. Thank you, Matt. Okay, next we have Carrie with public information. Oh, no. We, uh, we have the next oh, sorry. item. Yep, yep. yep. You're right. Individual plans of study. I, I, I mixed up, too. And he, um, yeah, he left. Next, we're going to talk about IPSs, which are individual plans of study. Um, their state board outcomes. And tonight we have Maria Kane from the high school, Jennifer Mendoza from the high school, Amanda Rich from DCMS, and if CMS, Rachel's going to be there if she needs to pop in. <laughs> but I will let them explain it because they'll do a lot better job than myself because they're living it every day. So. Hi, guys. Second month in a row. Um, if I learn how to use this. going to get started. Um, the individual plan of study honestly is something that the high school has already been doing. The state has asked that it is now required for 8th through 12th grade. We attended a really awesome training in Sublet to get kind of the lowdown on what IPS is and how it's going to benefit all of our students in our district. Currently um, we have started it in 6th grade at Dodd City Middle School and I believe Comanche is following the same suit and it's really just to get the kiddos um, kind of used to what the expectations are. So when they do get to eighth grade, it's not us teaching them something in a different way. It's more of you transition to middle school and this is what we're doing. And honestly, all students can definitely benefit with IPS. In fact, the state has been talking about bringing it all the way down to the preschool level. Um, what is IPS? IPS stands for Individual Plan of Study, and it's just that. Every student has a different plan for success, and the whole point of IPS is making sure that the student does have a plan for success, no matter what that is, post-graduation. Um, I know. Uh, so what, basically what we did is um, middle school, we adopted what the high school's doing. They have a really awesome Google form or Google sheet that we'll come to later. And what we did is we added other elements to it to be able to show the proof that the student is accomplishing their IPS. 
So on the form here in a little bit, it shows the Google Sheet that the high school created, which was all of the required pieces to it. It is what grade, um, what classes are they doing, what their grades are, um, what extracurricular activities they've completed, their ACT scores, their FastBridge scores, just who the student is as a whole um, from sixth through 12th grade. And then it adds in the evidence piece. So the evidence piece is what we have added in um, starting this year to really prove in Zello. Thankfully, we're very blessed to have that program. Thank you. Um, we have their portfolios in Zello that house all of the evidence to prove that they are doing what they have said they've done um, to prove that we are all stakeholders invested in their success once they leave Dodd City High School. Um, you guys go for. should have worn my glasses. So this is just talking about the Kansas Direct, the career development cycle. Um, Zello, when we talk about Zello, they take a career assessment, and then they look at those career assessments and try to decide what would be good. Marie Kim uses those assessments when she's um, looking at different um, opportunities and guest speakers to bring to our students. So those assessments are being used in several different of what the IPS looks like. <clears throat> no, you go. Is there a just uh a distinction between the individual plan of study and the individual educational plan. Do we still have IEPs? Okay. Are, so are those two still two different things? Yes, they're still two different things. Okay. IEP is what we're Or a, you can also have a gifted IEP, right. correct? Or okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it still falls under that one individual education umbrella. Okay. And then we have those that are um, they're IPS at something like the IEP is actually a little higher of the student at graduation. I just have here our Zello pacing guide. This is just an example of what the middle schools follow. Um, earlier, Jennifer was talking about the different types of things that our students do in Zello. This is exactly what they do. In sixth grade, they complete a matchmaker quiz, personality quiz, learning styles, mission complete, which is information about their saved careers that they've decided that after they've taken all of those quizzes, these careers might be something they're legitimately interested in. And Zello, I'm telling you, has thousands and thousands and thousands of different type of careers listed, careers that students don't even know are out there. Um, it's been a really great tool for them to learn about who they are, what their personality is like, um, and how that affects where they could be successful later on in life. Um, then seventh grade has some additional ones. Eighth grade, they build on top of that. And we do, like Maria does, we use and I pull reports for kids to see what their, um, what their saved careers are based on their personality, based on their um, learning styles. And we pull those kiddos and we bring them to different activities that Maria puts on at the Civic Center. So that way our kids can be exposed to career interests that they didn't really know they would or they knew they were and are making connections already as young as seventh grade. Um, but these are all uploaded into their Zello portfolio that every single parent, 612, has access to now. So their parents are now able to be invested stakeholders in their IPS and be able to have those conversations at home with those students. At the end of the year, we are all going to have our students be presenting their IPS to their families at the last set of conferences and um, especially this year so they can introduce their parents to it and then it will just become a thing where they will have constant access to their portfolio that they can be having these conversations at home as well as at school. Is that, is that home report or that report, are those in different languages? That it, whatever. Um, language? Actually, Zello is also in their home language. Um, while I was helping, this is the portfolio that we have started to create. While I've been helping students, I've been noticing that a lot of their Zellos are in Spanish. And so I'm like, thankfully, I know what the logos look like so I can help them push things through. But it is also in their home language. Once it's set up, say it's set up in Spanish, um, their parent will have access to it in Spanish as well. So if you're a parent that doesn't have internet access or you're not internet savvy, um, can they get this in print form as well? 
Um, so yes, it is printable. We would just have to be able to print it every time an update has been made. But I mean, it's possible, absolutely. And then they will also see it at conferences when the parents come. Awesome. Um, so we created the portfolio. Zello just came out. Before it was called something different. It didn't have as much access that it currently has. Uh, the portfolio came out last month. And this is just a quick little screenshot of where it is as um, the students, they click portfolio. And we have a whole process, different steps for them to take based on the career cycle that Jennifer mentioned earlier. And um, they have a guideline of thing, acceptable things to be putting in there and uh, to be able to prove that they're doing what they say they're doing in their Google Sheet IPS. So like I said, these are just quick little snapshots of what it looks like both on the parent side as well as the student side. goal that's customized for post-secondary goals. Um, this is something that is coming down from the state. Um, it also gives buy-in and intention intentionality to those who are doing the classes. We just don't want them to randomly come to these classes. We want them to have some buy-in to why are you taking this business? Because you're interested in business, you know, or is it just because your friend, friend A and B are taking it and you're taking it? So, we want our kids to have more buy-in so they'll do well in their classes. Okay, so the IPS really comes down to us meeting state standards and state criteria for graduation. So one of the most important components of the IPS is that we have a physical signature on every student's IPS K through 12. And so having four conferences a year, gives us a few extra opportunities to achieve that goal. But it is really important that the parents are on the same page as the students in that signature about what the students are doing. Um, the IPS also houses the data required for graduation. So it will show that students are getting the credits that they need for graduation, but they're also getting the correct credits that match their post-secondary goals. It also is going to serve down the road with the new graduation requirements as a place to hold those artifacts that students are going to have to have to prove that they're meeting those post-secondary assets or gaining those post-secondary assets that they need for graduation. And it also serves as a data collection for our key set indicators. So we are required to show what students' post-secondary goals are, and so that IPS shows what those students' paths are and that we're meeting those goals and that we are able to track where they're going after graduating high school and that we're offering those opportunities. Well, I, I just wanted to point out, we had an excellent hands-on opportunity of a career day that was here uh, last week. And could you explain a little, tell the board a little about what all that was? The one last week was actually put on by Southwest Plains, and so that was a tech showcase. And we are actually getting ready to have another one here on December 5th, and that one is going to be a business showcase. That is actually just going to be local businesses from Dodge City area, and it's going to target 7th and 8th graders from both middle schools, and then 9th and 10th graders from Dodge City High School, and just a way to introduce careers to them. So where Amanda said that they used that data from the Zello reports, we invite students to those events based on that. So it allows students to have that buy-in, and so they're not just clicking through taking another test. When they see that they get invited to events based on the answers that they're giving, um, then we are able to make connections and make it worthwhile for those students. So hopefully we can start getting those networking opportunities and job shadowing opportunities um, available. So this will be the second middle school career day that we're putting on. So. So we're doing it at multiple levels, and last week was kind of agriculturally oriented in the event, and I had the opportunity to walk through there, and several of the presenters were very impressed. There were kids in this particular situation, there were kids from other schools all around us, um, but they were able to talk about their career opportunities and what it would be like working for this company and that company, and it was just great feedback from the uh, company owners and the presenters themselves on working with the kids and having a chance to do this because the desire to grow your own is all over and Southwest Kansas is no exception. And so to have a facility like we have at the Civic Center for starters 
is a great place to be able to put some of that on, to have people that are organizing all of these individual plans of study and all that comes with it, uh, it not just because it's being required by KSDE, but because we know it's what's best for our youth to find purpose in life and to understand there are opportunities out there, some you've never heard of in these careers that we're talking about. So it's amazing how it takes a whole lot of pieces to get everything going in the right direction, but well, we have good things going on. So I wanted you to be aware of that. Didn't mean to cause a lull there, so. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, now we have Carrie with public information. Madam Vice President, board members, Dr. Dirksen, this week is American Education Week, and we are celebrating this week. Uh, you'll see the gifts that we have up there at your place, but a token of our appreciation and recognition um, of the hard work that all of our teachers, our staff members, um, all of the people that have roles within the district, what they do to provide a safe and great learning place for our students. So that's how we're celebrating it this week. Um, and I would make a couple of comments about the socks. So if you want to join the social media post and you want to rock your socks, let me know. We'll be happy to take a photo and share. So anyway, it's a pretty cool sock company. 100% um, cotton grown here in the United States and produced by our American farmers, and it's an American product. So that's what we chose to go with this year. Then I have a couple of updates for you. Um, one is the calendar. Uh, we have met, the committee has met. We have chosen two calendars. We'll be sharing that for an all staff vote and that will be November 27th through December 7th. And then on December 11th, we'll bring it to the board for your first read and then we will come back for your approval on January 8th. So that's an update on the academic calendar. We have that put in place. And then also I wanted to let you know on February um, 15th, we will be hosting Leadership Dodge and that happens to be CTE month. So we'll be sharing uh, a good amount of our pathway programs with the participating class. Any questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, now we have human resources with Jason. Good evening. My first request is to get moved closer to the front of this agenda, because everybody claps for those people when they come up here. <laughs> Nobody claps for me. <laughs> there we go. All right. So, um, one of my contribution this evening um, will be just some information. I had shared some of this in Week in Review in weeks past, um, and so I just wanted to pro provide you with a little bit more in-depth explanation of the fall vacancy, some of the things that we are currently doing within the district to continue to grow our own, um, as you heard from Dr. Gerbson from all aspects and areas of business out here, not just education. Um, we are focusing on trying to find talent locally and then um, grow them into the talent we need for our organizations. Um, and then I'll provide you with the opportunity to ask questions that you might have um, that, that are related or deal with the HR. Um, so real quick, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, skip down to the next slide on this, if we can, maybe. Oh, hey, it worked. Can you click on that fall vacancy report review real quick? Thank you. So just first off, just a recap of what actually constitutes a vacancy when we report these vacancies to KSDE each year um, in both the fall and the spring. Basically, there's two criteria that we look for in a certified teacher. The first thing is, does the person actually hold a true teacher certification of some kind with KSDE? The second piece is, is the person what is considered highly qualified? What that means is they're not just certified, but the endorsements that are listed on their license actually meet the subject area that they're teaching at the time. So we can have individuals, um, due to the local control we have, um, we can have individuals that are certified but not highly qualified, 
we have to report them as vacancies until they become highly qualified. So those are kind of the two components that we look for when we're trying to determine where our vacancies are, okay? So the second thing I've got up there are the statewide numbers, just so you kind of have an idea of where we're at. Um, if you look at that very first line under the top five, um, that's fairly alarming. That number grew 60% from the spring of 2023 to the fall of 2023, from 289 to 462 statewide in elementary education. So the, the focus on growing our own um, is that much more vital. Um, this, this is starting to spread, not just a, across the state, obviously, you're starting to see legislation from the federal level um, because of the crisis that we are in with the shortage of educators. Um, as, as the vice president of CASPA right now, I'm gonna have the unique opportunity to go advocate um, at the federal level um, as, a, as a representative for our organization with some of these bills and things that are in legislation to try to hopefully continue to gain traction on um, this from a, from a different perspective. Um, so if you, if you scroll down slightly, you'll start seeing our numbers show up. The good news, when you look at the overall trend in the data, nationally and statewide, Ours remain constant from last year. We reported 82 last year. We reported 82 this year for our fall vacancy. Um, out of those 82, 17 of those individuals are the ones that I just referred to earlier where we have allowed them for one reason or another to move out of their current endorsement area and teach in an en another endorsement um, area without actually having that endorsement on their license. We do work to try to put plans of study in place for those individuals to try to have them eventually work into having that endorsement so we can count them as certified and highly qualified eventually. Um, I can't say with 100% certainty that every one of those 17 people has a plan of study in place, but I can guarantee you that at least 90% of them do. Uh, many times, there it's teachers that have moved into a specialist area maybe a counselor, maybe a librarian, maybe some of those things that require an extra endorsement, but they're currently working on it, why they're acting in that position for us. Um, we did report a total of 65 long-term subs this year. Um, that is actually down from 74 last year at this time. So we made a gain there. And again, we, we put a, a strong effort in making sure that those individuals that our long-term subs in our district are working towards that endorsement area. You all have um, approved that tuition agreement um, in the fall where we have increased the amount of dollars that we're putting into those individuals. We have 13 people that have taken advantage of that tuition um, payment program at this point in time. And so you can see on those numbers, um, out of those 65 people that we reported, as long-term subs, 15 of them have actually already completed a licensure program. They're working on passing the appropriate exams so they can become certified teachers. Um, there is something new coming from the state in that realm. Um, here, hopefully in the next month or so, we're gonna see what it looks like, um, but the State Board of Education challenge or charged KSDE with coming up with some way for individuals that have attempted the um, praxis assessment twice in a content area to give a little bit more local control on allowing those people an alternative pathway to become certified if they're struggling to pass that content area test. I will share that with you when it becomes available. Obviously, we will take that very seriously. Um, we wanna make sure that the people that we are putting in classrooms have completed a certain amount of um, training and have the expertise and knowledge that we're looking for. 
we want to make sure that we don't utilize that as some sort of crutch or system for us to just funnel anybody we want into that. I'm, I'm assuming um, there will be some pretty stringent guidelines and things that we will have to follow in order to go that route. Um, but just FYI that that is coming um, and I will share it when it, when it gets here. Um, there are 17 more of those long-term subs that are actually currently enrolled in a teacher certification program. Um, like I said, there's 13 that are taking advantage of that new tuition payment program that we're offering. And then there are 16 of them that are interested in moving towards, a, they may be brand new, they may be just, just figuring out what the education world is all about. I um, reach out to them through the course of the year and try to sit down individually with them. And that's where this next piece that I will show you comes into play. If you want to go ahead and keep scrolling down slightly. So I just wanted to recap the total numbers. If you want to spend some time looking more at it um, by level, um, I put all of that in there and, and you have access to it. I don't want to sit up here um, and read that all um, out loud to you unless you want me to. But I will say one thing on the elementary level. Last year we reported 40. Um, so that number is slightly skewed because of the way the state had us um, report things this year. They added some categories clear down at the bottom. Our total elementary vacancies this year was 47. Last year we reported 48. So we actually went backwards from what the trend in the entire state did um, from last year to this year. So if you'll scroll all the way down to the bottom of that real quick, Regina. Jason, how, how was the question worded about do you need more support? So the, the, literally the question is, do you, do you believe you're receiving the support you need to be successful in our district? And again, it's, it's a very open-ended question to where I'm just trying to get that level of trust and communication. This is literally a form that I created that I could utilize to get feedback from those individuals. There's about 12 questions on it. Um, and then I... So everyone, as you could see in there, I, I will be in the process of sitting down and meeting with any and all of those individuals that felt like they needed more support um, to be successful or seeing what, where are those hangups or, or can we bridge the gap, so to speak. Okay. So. And then these are the new categories down here that I was referring to. They, they now have us report all level vacancies. So those endorsements that are like K-12 where you can teach any level when you have that endorsement. They put in a new category. That's where we um, lost a couple of those elementary teacher uh, vacancies. And then the school specialist vacancies are now their own category as of this year. So any questions other, other than Jeff's questions so far on just the vacancy report or the vacancies in general? Okay, so if you can go back to the presentation, please, Regina. Well, we're taking a moment. Remind me what we... Uh on the tuition assistance or reimbursement, what 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 did we decide? I'm sitting here thinking about it. And I can't remember. Yeah. So the the new tuition payment um, tuition assistant program that you all um, adopted in August, I believe, we will pay up to two thousand dollars per semester for up to four semesters. And again, there are some pretty stringent expectations that come with that. Um, there's a minimum of three year commitment to the district upon obtaining that if we offer you a certified position. Um, there are some expectations as far as plans of study and I meet, I meet with every one of those individuals and 
we go through that entire document and they sign off on that document um, and those stay on file both in my office and in the business office eventually um, once I get the board president's signature on those documents as well. Did we do that as a reimbursement or we just pay the college? So the, the very first time due to timing, we did have to do a couple of reimbursements, but they had to obviously show proof of payment of that tuition. Um, we do that as I, I work directly with the business departments at those colleges and universities, and we set up what is called third-party payment plans, where basically we can make payments on those students' behalf um, at a couple of the universities, I now am able to like basically see their stuff just like I see my son's stuff at Fort Hayes. They have given me access just to the billing and things. And so I get emails telling me that there's a new bill for so-and-so and I can actually just get in there, print those bills and submit them to the business office on their behalf. And they don't have to mess with any of that. And so what I, what I send out when I send out communication to this group of individuals, I tell them, please make sure you don't make a payment to the university. You're, let me know when they start telling you have an outstanding bill before you start making payments and let us make that first payment. That way, if there's a balance there, and, and most of the universities are now pretty good about communicating directly to me on those things as well. Yep. I've got a quick question. On the elementary, as a state, or I'm curious, just your philosophy, because to me, that's where it all starts is the elementary, you know, it's where they get their base of their education. It's scary that all these teachers are backing out of that. I'm just wondering what the state, you know, or federal, whatever says about this or what your opinion is. Why are we losing so many at that level? Well, f fortunately for us, we aren't, but I, I think I'd be speculating. Here, here's what I can tell you is something that I'm going to refer to right here in this rec recruiting and retention update. We um, participated in that EPIC survey. I've put that in the Week in Review a couple of times. Dr. Brett Church from Emporia State has been really developing this thought and, and, and idea and has, has a really good structure for trying to provide us with some data around some of these questions and has, has questions that are designed to help identify some of these key factors and things. So that survey statewide actually is open until November 22nd. After that survey closes, um, I stay in pretty close contact with Dr. Church as well. Our response rate three years ago, the last time we did it was around 15-ish percent. We are right at 70 percent right now. So I really feel confident that we will be able to utilize some of those data and those key factors as some of the drivers for our um, strategic plan goals within the employee portion. Um, and that's that was our overall goal. We actually did that survey with our classified staff last year. Tara has been working through um, some of those data points and figuring out and, and starting to develop some of those thought processes even from the classified staff level as to ultimately what we, we may look at from the HR perspective is, is because there, even though it takes all of us to run this organization, there are some key differences between being a certified staff member and a classified staff member. And so we may have some employee goals in both realms as we continue to develop this. But to your point, we we will get a lot of information, not just in our district, but statewide when all of this information comes back. So hopefully that will help give us some true data without speculating so much. But I will take the opportunity to speculate. And I will tell you that I have principals here that can tell me I'm wrong. And Richard Falcon is here from our friends with Compass Mental Health, and he can correct me if I'm wrong. But I want you to realize what we hear on national news and local news is real. And the, the pressure is mounting every day, and teachers feel that. And there is a shortage of support from home and school and teacher and students and there is you know the disrespect that we are always leaning on here about our district it, it's not just our district it's everywhere and and we're seeing the results in the numbers because people are getting tired of it because they can do simpler jobs for more pay and we have to respect 
the difficulties that exist. And we have to identify that this is a needed career, that you must have a passion to work with these children, and you must care about what you're doing. And, and we, we try to bring that all the time. And we have caring administrators that are trying to help support that. It's not easy. And, and the numbers are real. And Jason deserves so much credit for all the different wheels he has rolling for how we're trying to make things work because it's not simple. And he's the first one here and he's sometimes the last one to leave and he's always trying to help make sure we have the certified teachers that we need because the state keeps coming up with new demands. They tell us, well, you've gotta have this, you've gotta have that. And you can't just grow them on trees. I mean, it's, it's real. And so uh, I think the speculation will come out, and I mean, I could go on a bigger tangent, but, uh, uh, and that's why it's so important, and I'm so appreciative of the fact that we have a supportive board. You ask good questions, you care about what we're doing, but please understand, it's not easy, and, and we're living it every day. Well, from, from my chair, just from sitting here for 14, 15, I don't remember how many years, this is the biggest threat to education to me right now is our labor force. And um, we're gonna have to do some things internally and from the state level to create working conditions that are conducive for these people sitting in the room here and plus our, our teachers in the classroom. And it is, it is my biggest concern just from this chair of, for our district and, and, and for the country is that we can build a labor force to do the job that we have before us. And I think that's what you're saying, Dr. Dirksen. And I, I just wanna, um, I'm thankful that we're, you're reporting on it. I'm thankful that we're getting information, um, but I just wanna support any effort we can to work on this problem and, and so to me, it's the issue. There are a lot of issues, but if you had to put one at the top, that this would be the issue to me. Thank you. So, in recruiting wise and retention wise, obviously, there's a lot of things, a lot of factors that go into both of those. Um, recruiting wise, we continue to go out and visit all of the universities twice a year, uh, the local universities, the state universities. We do travel down into Oklahoma for a couple of recruiting events. We have made contact with right around 150 or so um, students that are enrolled in teacher ed programs through the seven visits that we've made so far this year. Um, we have developed unique ways to continue to stay in touch with those individuals. I am developing something else new this year for our administrators as we get into that hiring, that true hiring season com coming up, um, developing an electronic um, file cabinet, so to speak, where I have all of that contact information that we have captured from those visits, along with the resumes and things that we have captured from those individuals. So when it comes time to where you just have to pick up the phone and start calling folks, we will now have that information more readily avail available um, to our hiring managers, our, our building leaders. Um, I do some, some uh, 30,000 foot view contact stuff. I, I develop s'mores newsletters, um, different things like that, that I send out once or twice a month, just trying to keep us relevant with those individuals, trying to increase the opportunities for them to maybe come visit our district. Last year, we brought several in um, on visits just to see what we're about. We feel good about the product we have in our school system um, and feel like if we can get people here, we will have a chance to move up maybe um, on, on that list. Um, but again, some of, the, some of the challenges we faced aren't, face aren't secrets. Um, some of them will have to be attacked community-wide, not school district-wide. Um, housing, um, daycare, th those, those types of challenges, th those are like economic development type things that we have to create partnerships and we have to really think big picture for our community as a whole. Um, and, and we can't, con I mean, there, there are many factors that people are looking for in where they wanna go spend their career that have nothing to do with what's happening within inside the walls of our schools. And that's 
real. That's true. So on that note, the, the last piece that I have um, is just I wanted to share a few of the things that we have developed or, or ways that I do communicate. Are we back on that? So I can click this thing maybe, or maybe it's go ahead and go, click through that. So Jason, kind of to your to your point Keep there. Going. Okay, right there. Yes. Yeah, kind of, kind of to your point there. Um, so, I, of course, I know it's a nationwide trend. People are moving away from the profession, very difficult to recruit and retain. But with that said, you know, because not only do we have the uh, issues as it relates to what's just going on in education and the public in general, we also, now I love Southwest Kansas, but we also live in Southwest Kansas, right? To your point, which also brings its own set of challenges of, people not wanting to move to this area. So are the, ur are, are the metropolitan urban area, is Wichita facing the same kind of shortages? Are we seeing this in yeah. Kansas City areas, Johnson County areas? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And it, I mean, it, we could have, we could talk about this for three days, but my, my biggest concern, um, one of my biggest concerns is the fact that others are starting to see this. And so those areas that that are more attractive potentially to some of these candidates, it's going to be that much harder. We we were ahead of the game, ahead of the curve with some of the benefits and things that we were offering to be really attractive to people, even though they thought, ooh, Western Kansas, I don't know. Now that's going to become extremely difficult because my colleagues are, in fact, had a request today on a Google form. Can you please share some of the things that you're doing to attract new teachers? And would you be willing to share all of those? Th like they want to know now what we were doing um, to attract those new teachers and what. So yeah, it, it's going to become increasingly difficult in locations like this if we don't look at this big big picture and really start thinking what it takes. To, to see our community thrive because many people who grow up here and go through education here stay here. And so we are literally <laughs> educating our community and the future of our community. So. So don't share those trade secrets. <laughs> <laughs> I have a heart, like literally the whole coach part of me and the, the recruiting aspect, it's like what? Why would I want to tell you who, what secrets we're using? But yeah, it, it's tough. So my last thing here, and then I'll get off the stage, but I wanted to share this. So this is something that I started developing because I'll be honest, when I came in to the HR office, I couldn't spell HR. Um, and then I realized just how confusing HR could really be. Um, and so as I started having conversations with um, candidates that could be in our grow your own model, I needed to do it in a manner that made sense to them and help provide them with the resources without just massively confusing them. And so I started working on this. So the slides that are in here are all the slides that revolve around the pre-service teacher. So that terminology basically means you do not have a teaching license yet, but you are in a program or you are interested in being in a program to get one. And so- and How many do we have right now? What's the number for that? So total number working towards that would be in the 20-ish. We have 13 of them that have taken us up on the tuition agreement. Again, some of them I sat down with them and when you get to that last page and you start going through those things that they are required to fulfill, and it's like, not quite sure I want to do that, but it, it hasn't hindered them from continuing on from the, from the personal aspect. So, so, like right here, the very top line on each one of these is just kind of where are they currently? So we kind of use this from, from my perspective kind of as let's identify where you're currently at and then let's look at what opportunities are available from that aspect. So this first slide is somebody that has no current KSDE license or bachelor's degree but is employed by our school district. 
in some capacity. So we would go through here and, and we would take a look at the different opportunities and the different universities that we have developed partnerships with um, that might fit them. And each one of those things that's in blue underlined is a link to information um, for those universities or for the different resources that we have within the district that they can go check out. Um, the teach grants and the service grants, those are all links to information on how to apply for those different grants and things that some of our people might be um, uh, awarded. So the second one, so okay, I don't have a license or a bachelor's degree, but I do have 60 hours of college credit, so I do have an emergency sub-license. So here is some information about where or what we might be able to do with an individual in that capacity that has proven. And, and again, the majority of our long-term subs, they are individuals that the building principals have identified as having some talent and, hey, like this person gets it, let's see if we can get them in a longer term and then get them working towards certification. Um, most of those individuals, it's not just like, hey, you got a long-term sub, or you got a sub license, here's a job. Again, we, we know what's at stake here, and we know what we could cause for ourselves if we just put anyone in those positions. So we do vet those things, and we do make sure that we provide the support required from the instructional perspective when we have those individuals working in that capacity. And you've heard Kelly Clark. Um, I work very closely with Kelly and Scott in the academic office in making sure that we have the proper support for those individuals that we are helping work through those situations. And do they all work all the time? No. But I'm telling you what, I was in the classroom for 17 years and it didn't always work for me neither. So it, it's not a game of perfection. Right. It's a game of growth. And it's a game of learn from what I did yesterday so I don't do the same thing tomorrow if it didn't work and I build on it if it did. And I think too many times in education we get caught up in, in trying to be perfect. It, it's constant growth and it's constant self-reflection to, to continue to move forward. And so that's, that's what we challenge all of these individuals to do. So the next slide are some opportunities for some alternative licenses where you can actually work as a certified teacher while you're going to school if you're eligible for one of these licenses. So most of these path, all of these pathways require a bachelor's degree in something ahead of time. And so if you have a bachelor's degree and you want to become an elementary teacher, um, we now have the LTAP, which uh, Wichita State is the one university that runs that program. That is exactly why the State Department of Kansas partnered with Wichita State in the Kansas Registered Teacher Apprentice Program that we are piloting this year. Um, that program will go um, state, statewide next year, and so we will continue to have access to that. So we can have individuals work towards um, some of those other licenses. We also now have universities that have gone through a, an accredited vetting process and created programs to allow elementary educators that have a bachelor's degree to work towards a master's degree why they get the pedagogy courses, so to speak, for the education purposes. Um, and so that is termed a LEAP license. Um, and so the, the universities that we have partnered with are up there, and we have two individuals in our district right now at the elementary level that are on a LEAP license, so they are no longer a long-term sub. They are a certified teacher of record Why they complete their um, degree program and, and take those assessments. And then we have the true restricted license, which is the secondary version of the LEAP license. Basically, you have to have a bachelor's degree, but that bachelor's degree has to be in the content area that you are going to teach. Um, you have to pass the practice assessments up front before you're even allowed to enroll in the Transition to Teach program, um, or the, 
the programs that are designed for this license are called Transition to Teach programs. Um, Keisha, who you just heard about earlier tonight, completed the Transition to Teach program over the last two years in our district. And we currently have about four other individuals completing that process in our district. And then finally, the Kansas Registered Teacher Apprentice Program. And, and again, we are in a pilot um, with that program. Honestly, from the HR perspective, it really didn't change much as to what we were doing. This is one of those federally driven programs um, where the president and then at the state level, they are trying to get involved in filling the teaching gap, so to speak. And so this was one of the things that the federal government had challenged states to do. Um, our state has picked it up and ran with it. Really, from our perspective, what it, what it did is give some of our um, employees an alternative funding source and gave the district an alternative funding source to allow some of our people to become certified. Um, but it really wasn't much different than what we were already doing with the universities that we had partnered with. So if you want to see the actual number of licenses that are available through KSDE sometime, it's about three pages long on a spreadsheet. Any other questions? I, I, I do appreciate all, all of your support because it, it truly does take all of us to make this work. I apologize that I took a whole lot longer than I intended to, but um, I believe it's important. And to Jeff's point, we've got to continue to think about it differently. The people, the, the people just aren't out there. I mean, that's right. Yeah. On the long-term sub pay, I know that they, if it's their first year, they're not getting benefits. Is that correct? That is false to a, to a point. So as I continue to skate this fine line, because from my perspective, I got to be real careful because I need those people to be driven. And there's got to be a benefit to being a certified teacher or why do it? So what we decided at the cabinet level last year um, when I took it to cabinet because I also want to take care of people. That's my job. Um, th they are our people. If they are currently in a program working towards teacher certification, they can become eligible for benefits day one. If they are not, then we they go through the normal look back period when our benefits eligibility comes up for ACA purposes and they become eligible in their second year. So during the campaign that just finished, I got more questions about long-term subs than anything in the district. So I, clearly I, it's a hot I would not, issue. I would not doubt that. And, and as I put in my information, the number one question or the number one thing that they would love to see or have access to would be at least something when it comes to sick time and those things. I'm actually taking a proposal to cabinet tomorrow um, that I, I, I started on a couple weeks ago. And um, so I'm taking a proposal back to cabinet tomorrow to maybe do something along those lines. But again, I can't, from, from my perspective, I can never let this be equal, so to speak, um, because then why become a teacher? The, the, the problem is the state requires that we have certified teachers. So if we make all the benefits the same for people that are not certified, then there's no reason for them to get certified. So we have to continue to balance between what is required by the state and what we need. And we're trying to take care of them, but we've got to have them working towards that goal. Otherwise, we're going to be the ones punished. And that's a, that's a fine balance, and I get it. Yeah, at the 210 a day, I mean, there's some- $38,000 a year job. That's a, that's a higher base salary than many districts have for starting educators. But in a, in a place where, uh, again, cost of living is, yeah, it's reasonably high when you talk about housing and the inflation now, but it's nothing like probably living in the east side of the state where some of those places exist, so. Yeah, I think just that 
balance of that's good money, but with no benefits. If it I, it I, goes down quite a I bit. I get it. The yeah, I do because I I looked at that myself, and it's it's a lar- Like when you realize, wow, oh, that's like forty some thousand dollars over a five year span that I make, and people are trying to. I mean, the exact comment. I got from the negotiating team last year, one of the members was, well, Garden City's goal is to catch us this year. And that was last year. So I I don't know if they did or not, um, but they're, I mean, you all as a board and, and as a district were ahead of this game before the game really existed. And, and now we're gonna see what we're really about because now there's really, a competitive market out there. And I, I tell people all the time, these new teachers are in a free agent market and you better believe it <laughs> because if you, if you don't and you think you can do everything the way you've always done it and, and be successful, you're going to have a rude awakening. So we, we will continue to look at how we do things and what we do, but even that's a, f- a fine balance because you, you don't retain the good ones when you're t- culture turns toxic because the ones coming in just got way more than already exists. And so th- there's just a lot of things that go into it. And I can assure you, we take, we take all of that very serious and we'll continue to, and we'll do the very best we can for the students in our district. Cause that's really why we're here. Right. The numbers, numbers proved that we didn't go down. So that's good. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. All right, we're ready for Hammer with business services. Good evening, board members. I'm just going to keep it simple tonight, and I'm just going to ask you for some money to buy some light bulbs. (laughs) um, That's a lot of light bulbs. I can't handle that complexity you guys just talked about. So it's about three semi loads worth of light bulbs and that's $113,000 worth of light bulbs, but it's LED lighting for the high school. And what we've been doing is picking a building. So, so far we've done Sewell, Beeson, Lynn and Bright Beginnings and changing those over to LED lighting. This one's huge because it's at the high school and it'll take a while. Uh, But what we've been able to do is just buy enough for a building and then as maintenance has time we work them in and it's it's pretty easy to get the hallways and the commons areas because you can do those whenever you can do those classrooms are a little tougher because you got to do those when they don't have class so this is enough to get the entire building done um what i didn't do for this one was calculate the payback but if i'm going off a of memory here but on the others i think it was between one and a half and two years payback on these investments and what we see in the savings after we do this uh, um, initial so this is just continuing on with the plan that we've been on it's it's kind of an elephant to go through the district and do that so we've just kind of and this is a big bite because it's the high school but that's kind of been our approach is just take it one bite at a time and work through it so this is kind of off the subject but it's related to lighting and i can't remember if i visited with you briefly about it or if it was dr Dirksen, I got a question from a couple of people. It's not one that I've filled it often through the years, if even ever, but I had a couple of people ask me about it. The uh, tennis courts that we have at the, uh, the high school, um, are, those, are those accessible to the, to the public? As far as I know, I believe they are open, yeah. Okay, and do the lights, are those on through the night? Can you turn them on? Because I was asked about LED lighting <laughs> At the high school, I don't tennis know courts. The to that okay. Does Martha or Matt? Do either one of you know? You do. Okay, but you can access them and turn them on if you wanted to play out there at seven and eight o'clock in the evening or so. Okay. So I, I don't know if there's cost savings there. I don't know if it's because it's just better lighting to play tennis under. I, I, I think the lighting on the tennis courts is one or two years out on the capital outlay plan. It's on there, I don't okay. remember exactly. It's not on there for this year, but but it is on there. So I, I'm not making an argument either way, just something that was brought to my attention by a couple of different individuals. So I wanted, since we were talking about lighting. It's amazing how much brighter and 
you know, cheaper they are to run and they're not hot and it's just quite a difference. You, you will see a big difference like we did it at some of the car lots and now we're getting ready to transfer all of them over to it. So oh, I'm definitely good. a believer. So I will definitely make the motion to go forward with this. Mm. Second. Okay, Jamie made a motion and Ryan second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Um, and then last for this evening, it is uh, for the repair of a rooftop unit uh, at the high school. Not sure when it happened, but somewhere along the way, uh, the cover or part of the cover came off of the external unit that sits on, on the top of the building and birds built several nests in there. And so when we ran the heater for the first time, those <laughs> nests actually caught on fire. Everything was okay in the building. Um, I mean, they did actually smell some smoke, which is what alerted them to it. Uh, but it did damage all the guts of the rooftop unit, if you will. So this is, you know, so it wasn't scheduled. The, you know, it is definitely beyond its useful life now. So it's it's about $60,654.37 to replace that. But we do need to replace that. We have the money in the contingency funds, and that's what it's there for is things like that. They did go. They did inspect all the rest of the roof just to make sure. That's the, It's not the exact spot of the roof, but the high school is where we had the rooftop unit that actually rolled over because of the wind. I can't say that that's when that happened, but it, it seems likely that something along those lines certainly could have done that to take the protective cover off of it. So don't know the root cause, uh, but this is what we, you know, so right now that's out of service and that's what we need to do to get this replaced. Any questions on that? I'll make a motion. I'll second it. Okay, Tracy made a motion and Jeff second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much. Okay, Fred, we are All right. for Superintendent Roundup. Thank you, Madam Vice President. And I uh, take this opportunity to publicly congratulate the incumbents on their successful election results. And I tell you, not so fast. The results are not official official until the canvassing is performed tomorrow morning at 830. So we can't uh, say we're done until we're done, all right? And so that actually technically doesn't happen until 830 tomorrow morning. I'll notify everyone if there's anything to be concerned about and nothing I know of. So um, I am appreciative that you're willing to put yourself out there and run again, and I do congratulate each of you. Um, a reminder to all of you, a civics lesson as well, um, each of you uh, that were just recently elected must take the oath before the uh, board meeting on January the 8th, or because your term actually ends uh, December 31st and then the first board meeting in January, even if you're reelected, which the three of you are, you still have to take the oath. That can be done by a notary or it can be done at the courthouse in the clerk's office, uh, but it has to be done to be official. So make sure you remember that, okay? I think, didn't we do it together last time here? Yeah, I, I think so. I think it was done here, somebody. But if you want to go to the courthouse and make it official there, you can also do that. So um, I wanted to make sure you were aware that last week was buffer week and winter activities began actually today. I also want you to uh, be aware that tomorrow, uh, three of us, Matt and, uh, well, more than three, will be taking part in a Zoom with the city as we work on the uh, entry project for the high school. There, there are some developing uh, plans that are going on and we'll keep you posted. A lot of it right now is just being guided by the state, the highway, and the city working together. We've agreed to pay for our part of the engineering study we're putting together those plans, so it is working that way. Uh, <clears throat> within a month, we will be presenting some transportation requests to you for new buses and new uh, vehicles. And I, I just want to make sure you realize and we have a family car dealership here, the struggle that we have had. <clears throat> a year ago this month, we ordered vehicles, and this month, we received notification that they no longer even make the vehicle we ordered. We waited an entire year and nothing happened. And now we're told, and we're trying to go to plan B, we're shifting gears, we're trying to do something different, but it, it's something we didn't know until the last week or two. And so 
that doesn't change the fact that we have a pressing need. We, we have a junk pile bus out here. One of our activity buses is for the bone pile because it blew the motor and it's worthless. And we are short an activity bus and we need activity buses because as Ryan was talking, we live in Southwest Kansas. A lot of our activities aren't in Southwest Kansas and we have a, a shortage now of our activity buses. So that's gonna be on the order. So automatically we know we're spending some money. And um, then we also have some vehicles for our maintenance department and others that we'll be bringing. So I just ask you to uh, keep that in mind. And, and as always, we'll have done our homework and, and make a good presentation of our vehicle requests, knowing that we're still behind from last year's order. So that's interesting. And related to that, I don't wanna just pick on vehicles. Um, more than 12 months ago, we ordered audio equipment for this very room so that the clicker will work and so that you know, screens will work. And that hasn't came in yet either. We're still waiting on that. And so it's very frustrating, but it, it's the way things are right now. I would like for you to, if you have a pen or pencil, to write down January 29th. I would, that is a fifth Monday in the month of January. And I would like to schedule a work session on January 29th for the board so that we can get together and hash out our facility needs and priorities for the coming years. We are at a point now, we've been talking about some of our projects. I want to get the board on board so that we can move forward with some of our facilities. We have several different items. We'll have a crash course and a uh, finance lesson on uh, Capital Outlay 101. We'll tell you where we're at, we'll tell you how it works. And then we'll look at what we have around the district needs wise related to facilities. Hopefully that works with most of you. I picked it because it is a fifth Monday, not a common time. Uh, and so 6 p.m. an evening, we'll just meet right here and it will be less than two hours. Okay, so <clears throat> that added to that. Um, I believe those are the important items that I had. Uh, uh, I do want to credit all the administrators for their efforts to recognize our veterans. We had very nice uh, ceremonies throughout the district. Um, I emailed you the uh, story that occurred at Comanche. That was very moving. And if you haven't had a chance yet to see the background of that, please catch up on that because uh, it, it was very real and, and very uh, moving, I would say. And uh, so I appreciated that greatly and hope that you had a chance to uh, read up on that. That concludes the superintendent roundup for this month. Okay. Uh, so the Board of Education member district responsibilities, Ryan, Parks and Rec. Um, we have... Oh, we were supposed to have a meeting tomorrow that has been canceled and moved to next month. Uh, I will say briefly, I don't have a whole lot of uh, detail. There are some workups, so I could bring something next month for the board to take a look at. But they are, uh, there was a master plan that was presented for the park zoo combination. Um, I don't think the commission is taken an official vote on moving forward with anything as of yet, but by all indication, it looks like they're gonna move forward on this new master plan that has been uh, uh, developed and it uh, looks like they'll probably take it in phases. So phase one will kind of deal with uh, the overhaul of the zoo, which some of that work's kind of already being done as well as uh, new playground equipment, things like that. And there was another piece to that phase one that I just can't um, recall. But I asked if I could share this information and Nick Hernandez told me to, to go ahead. So yeah, it, like I said, by all indication, it looks like they're gonna move forward on, an, on, a, on a master plan there at the uh, at Wright Park. Yeah, from, yeah, it looks really, really nice. I'll bring you guys some handouts so you take a look at it. So that's, that's what I've got. Okay. And next is Bright Beginnings. And so uh, we had our meeting on November 2nd. And um, they always send out a community assessment and then a self-assessment. And so we had pretty good participation. There was 230 community mem members that completed that. And there were 60 staff members that completed that. Um, the staff, the top two things that stood out is that they're ca compassionate and caring. So positive things. So that was good. Um, needs, community needs. 
is medical, doctors was one of the number one. And then the other thing is just having more family activities and opportunities and things that are here for the families to be able to enjoy and not have to pay a lot of money for and things. So those are the two things that stood out. We'll get more information because that was just kind of a preliminary of it. So hopefully next month we'll get more in depth with that. And then uh, Early Head Start had, um, they went and did, they did a family pumpkin painting event and the parents got to help the kids with that, which uh, that helps them work on their fine motor skills. And then um, they also, well, they already said that, participated in the Victory Electric Pumpkin Festival. And um, all the programs are full. And if there is any vacancies, like they're filled within two or three days, and there is a wait list, a full wait list of 28 parents as teachers and 69 in the daycare. Yeah. So that's why I'm saying they're filled pretty quickly. Wow. Yeah. So. The wait list is 69 for daycare? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and 28 for parents, yeah. So it's definitely a big need within our community, so anyway. Okay, um, special education? You know, I'll just say about, I bring a student to the alternative and, and the, the new parking lot and everything works really, really slick at, 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 uh, at Bright Beginnings and Head Start. Okay. Um, I, my report is good news. Uh, there's a Century Walk uh, grant for Ross Elementary. And then compliance issues, uh, we had almost 100% of our IEPs updated with progress in October. And we have completed a federal file review. We are compliant in all areas except one question in two districts. I don't have a bad news column, so that ends my report. <laughs> okay, so we have legislative. <laughs> And capital outlay. I'm laughing at the legislature, not you. Other than the light bulb? Yeah. Is that okay? That's okay. <laughs> and calendar committee, do you have anything to add? Nope, Carrie covered it in which okay. vote. All right, so then review district bills prior to December board meetings, Jamie. And then um, has on here for announcements that this last weekend, just to let you know, there was the KASB annual convention in Wichita. And so. Does anybody have anything to read? Um, yeah, I, I was there a couple of days. I had KASB board meeting, which was rather interesting as it related. We went around the various regions and people that were up for re-election shared the outcome and how things kind of went in their respective areas. So that was kind of fascinating to hear some of the things going on around the state as it related to that. Complete turnover of some boards. Incumbents being reelected in other places, so it was just it was really interesting. But uh, I did set in on uh, where'd he go? He left me. Clayton and I. I set in on the uh, um, the law seminar, for lack of a better way to say it. Um, they spent a lot of time talking about the uh, out of district. Uh, oh, how, how's it coined? What's the phrase? Was how was Matt speaking to that? I was telling him that we set in on that seminar together. At KASB on the uh, and uh, it was an all-day seminar by and large. But one of the more interesting parts was when they were talking about the taking out of out of district students and those kind of. One of the things that I found interesting, and please correct me if I'm uh, wrong. I almost mentioned it when Matt was speaking, but I thought I might have a chance to talk later about it. So uh, yeah, there's not a whole lot of wiggle room as it relates to you not being able to take a student in your district. There are some exceptions, but for the most part, it's uh, for, uh, open enrollment by by and large you can and as was already mentioned here probably not so much as an issue as it would be in your Wichita's or your Olathe areas Johnson County areas things of, of uh, that nature but uh, the way that some of those bigger districts well I guess we are a large district but those more metropolitan or urban areas are dealing with it is there was a clause where you can cap your enrollment um, and say, we're just going to allow this many number of students into our classroom, and that gives you an out, ultimately, not to have to take new students into your, uh, into your district. So Clayton and I was kicking that back and forth because some of them have already passed policies within their district, and they were just throwing out arbitrary numbers. And one of the more common numbers was it was uh, 14 students per, per classroom. So I never got to ask anybody, and maybe... Clayton knows something I don't. So, because I, I was telling Clayton, I was like, "Well, 
we're averaging what 25 students per classroom maybe here in 22. 22, okay. Isn't that where we ca we, we tried to cap? I think we've gone to 23 on some. Like I said, here it probably won't <clears throat> be an issue like it would be in some of these other areas, but I was like, you know, we average, I was going with the number 25. I was like, so if we came in there and arbitrarily said we're just going to cap it at 14, does that mean we literally have to have 14 students in the classroom or can we cap it at 14, but we're still running 25 per, per class? But yeah, they've already started doing some, uh, taking steps to do that. Yeah, go ahead. Chime in, Clayton. Oh, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> that we did talk about what said, well, it's one to 14 is our max ratio, and so we don't have to let anybody else in uh, if we wanted to do something like that. But then we'd turn around and violate it all the time with that language. Uh, so it didn't seem like a yeah, probably good option. Yeah, that, yeah. And, and the other side of that coin is where that's becoming an issue with some districts where they are capping low is with negotiations. Then teachers are saying, look, I'm, I'm, ha I'm having to deal with. <laughs> <laughs> two okay. times the size of the class that you said that you said we're gonna have oh, there you go well okay. so, so, yeah yeah well me no good deed goes unpunished yeah Clayton. they talked yeah. about not only out of district but out of state so if you had a kid in Oklahoma who wanted to come to USD 443 it's the non-residents non-resident it's not yeah no, it's outside of 443's boundary and so it would be an out-of-state student which would apply in the Kansas City metro area I think uh, if Missouri Kids coming to Kansas, Kansas kids going to Missouri. I've shared that list before, and we do have students that come from other districts, as we have students in Dodge that go to other districts and always have had. And uh, some of our CTE courses really attract some kids from other high schools because it's not offered in their high school, and we've always welcomed that type of student as long as there's no uh, background concerns or no issues. So it, it, this isn't new to us, and, and with us being in southwest Kansas, I, I don't think there's a big migration towards that. So we'll see though, I mean, it isn't here yet. Yeah, the one other thing I'd mention is it talks about transportation expense and whether as a district you'd be required to provide transportation. And the answer was no, special ed could be, um, you know, some a different story, but a regular ed student from out of district, you wouldn't be required to drive to Elkhart to pick them up every day. That's a little bit about what I did. Right. Thank you, Clayton. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right, for announcements, November 13th through the 17th, this week is American Education Week. November 21st is pre-K and staff two-hour early dismissal. And the offices will be closing two hours early for the holiday. November 22nd, 23rd, and 24th, Thanksgiving break. And then November 27th is Board of Education luncheon meeting at Northwest Elementary at noon. Do you guys have anything that's you want put on the board agenda or any other items? I don't know if it needs to be a, an agenda item per se, but maybe just a week in review. We were talking about pathways, CTE, tech ed path. I, can, can we get a list of what pathways we offer? I, okay. Yeah. Yes, we can. No okay. problem. Yeah. Some of them I'm familiar with, of course, but I, I know I don't know all of what's going on. So, yeah. Well, they grow them all the time. Yeah. And the uh, Supreme Court will be at the high school tomorrow. Oh, that's right. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. All right. Um, anything else? Okay, so we do have an executive session, um, and it's for the Kansas Law 754319 for discussion of personnel matters of non-elected personnel pursuant to the non-elected personnel exception under COMA. And we need about 15 minutes? Uh, 10. 10. Uh, 10. Jason Sheck. Uh, school attorney and myself. Okay. You want to make a motion? I'll make a motion. Okay. Second. Okay, so Ryan made a motion for executive Aye. session and Tracy seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.